So when I talk about information pollution, I use it as a catch-all, and it usually comes into two terms. And the first one to me is, is the one I've decided to focus most of my career on, which is disinformation. It's often conflated with another term that I'll define in a moment called misinformation. They are not the same. They're related, but they are not the same. Disinformation is intentional. This is where you have an actor who is intentionally pushing misleading or false narratives through targeted channels to exploit a targeted vulnerable audience. So the, so the whole point of it is that they actually want something out of somebody else and they're manipulating. It's a manipulative, it's an intentionally manipulative communication device. Um, I've broken it down into six elements. There's reasons I've done that as a framework. I think it, first of all, I think it helps clarify a structure on how to think about disinformation and how to spot it. It also helps communicate to somebody who's potentially being misled and being victimized, um, you know, what they might be seeing and what what campaign is happening to them. And it also helps us articulate in the research field who is looking at which piece. So the psychologists are looking, for example, at the first piece, which is the malign actors. Why is somebody trying to um, manipulate somebody else? They're also looking at um, piece five, the targeted vulnerable audience. So why do people believe the information that's coming at them? And I'll do a little bit of explanation based on my reading of their stuff. The accountants are looking often at number two, which are the incentives. And I'll move into that discussion in a moment too. But I'm skipping around. Basically, the six elements are you have actors who have incentives to craft a narrative through a channel to a targeted vulnerable audience for exploitation. Those are the six steps. The incentives that we look at mostly in our field are financial. We've spent a tremendous amount of energy around financial frauds as one example. It's important to know that often these actors are looking for social psychological incentives. I've done a ridiculous amount of reading now into things like malignant narcissism in the psychology literature. I've looked at cult psychology literature, I've looked at theology, I've looked at anthropology, um, just because I'm trying to understand the humans in, in this structure. And there are a lot of papers that discuss the need for, for example, narcissistic supply. It's an incredibly powerful need, apparently, almost some I would characterize as an addictive need. And so the need for affirmation or for retribution um, might be social psychological incentives. Power is certainly one, and power and finance typically go together. Physical control, physical access. Um, I'll give you a, a very dark example of that in a moment. And, and it's important to recognize that the incentives are not mutually exclusive. In fact, many of these go together. You'll often see all of these incentives in play. Um, another thing to talk about is the dissemination channels. We often focus now on social media. That's an incredibly powerful dissemination channel. Um, I think it's important to think about the targeting. So I'm going to go for the dissemination channel where I know the audience is. So I, I first identify, you know, what audience am I after? And then I think about where are they and how can I access them? We tend, as I said, to focus almost too much on social media and even particular social media. So right now there's a lot of energy around X as a platform because for good reason, I mean, X has a lot of toxic narrative in there. But it's important to realize that there are so many other channels. AM radio in the United States has been a channel for um, information. The newspapers have been a channel. And even as importantly, face-to-face -face communication and word of mouth has been a dissemination channel forever throughout history. Uh, and now one of the most powerful dissemination channels um, are podcasts and also WhatsApp. There's a lot of disinformation uh, pushed through WhatsApp and directly into your feed. So one-on-one so -on -one actually is a dissemination channel as well. One piece on the targeted vulnerable audience, this gets into micro-targeting. We place so much data about ourselves on the internet that one of our colleagues, David Stilwell, who actually teaches in the Cambridge EMAC, he is one of the world's experts on what's called psychometrics. He was one of the first people to work with colleagues to pull, I believe it was 200 data points out of Facebook, your likes, your reposts, what you communicate back to other people's chats, what you place into a chat or into a, into a Facebook post. 
And he said with 200 data points, he could pinpoint your personality profile as precisely as somebody you've married. So reflect on that for a moment. You have a life partner. You've been with them tens, dozens of years. And with 200 posts on Facebook, I can pretty much be as accurate about who you are as a human being, what you like, what you hate, who you hate, whether you have any biases, whether you're racist, whether... I can trigger it. Fundamentally, with that data, I know what to trigger. I know how to get you angry. I know how to get you laughing. I know how to get you to spread um, beyond it. So if I send something to you, you might go, oh, this is funny. I'm going to share it. So the targeted vulnerable audience piece, the sophisticated, um, we have a lot of sophistication around how to target information to those audiences. Examples in my field, it's fraud. I mean, you know, Bernie Madoff, Theranos, Wirecard, on and on and on. I mean, this is running this disinformation structure. I also noticed too, one of the reasons I came up with the structure and said that accounting is inherently in the disinformation space is because it shares the same structure as predatory sexual offenders too. This gentleman was a, a doctor who was working with uh, gymnasts, uh, female gymnasts, particularly in the United States. These were mostly Olympic gymnasts and, and, and university gymnasts athletes and he was providing false incentives to the parents to the coaches to the university and to the victims about his healthcare regime healthcare in quotes um and he was able to victimize that way and it also runs through authoritarian um enterprises which we call mafia states so okay um again the, the key piece to disinformation is it's intentional misinformation on the other hand is not intentional so we often end up passing misleading narratives because we don't understand things. So if I were to communicate to you about medical stuff, I am very likely to misinform you because I'm not somebody who's sophisticated in medical technology. I'm not a doctor. You also see it in cases like this, which is the old famous telephone game, where if you share a piece of information, by the time it gets even two or three people deep, it's completely different than what it started. Sometimes we just don't have enough information. We saw this in, for example, um, the opening night of the terrorist attack in, in um, Israel. We see this all the time in the news where, where the, the news media isn't really quite sure what's happening. So there's like a, um, a, a moment where there's confusion. And so there's a lot of misinformation happening there. And often misinformation follows disinformation. So if I'm a malignant actor, I can push information into the, the, the atmosphere that is completely false. And other people believe me because I'm a professor at Cambridge. And so they'll share it because they trust me. And, and so they're misinformed. Um, I've intentionally placed it. So it's important to know this distinction.